seems like one of the questions that we're getting very wrong today is what exactly it means to be a man. There's all kinds of discussion and conversation about gender issues and what exactly gender means and whether or not there's a real difference between man and woman and all those things. And um, it's, it's a bit like, remember in The Little Mermaid, that movie, where she finds a fork and she brings it up to this bird who's supposed to be the expert on human materials, artifacts, and uh, he looks at it for a second and then he says that it's a dingle hopper and that humans use it to curl their hair with. And then later in the movie, we see the Little Mermaid curling her hair with it. My wife is named Ariel, so... Uh, We've watched The Little Mermaid with our daughter. But here's what I mean, is that very often what we're doing, and what young people today unfortunately are doing, is looking to the culture, looking to the world, looking to Hollywood, looking to music, looking to television, looking to other places to tell them what exactly a man is. And that is akin to swimming up to the the seagull, who has no clue really what a man is, and asking it what a man is. It didn't make man. That seagull didn't make the fork. It doesn't know what the fork was made for. It's never even seen it being used appropriately. (laughs) But God is the one who made man. In fact, the Christian view is that everything that exists came out from God, that there was God, and that everything that now is came out from God, which includes manhood and womanhood. And so the only logical thing to do when asking what a man is to, is to ask the one who made it. Just like if you want to find out what a painting is of, you ask the painter. If you want to find out what a statue is, you ask the sculptor. If you want to find out what an invention is, you ask the inventor. The only way to know what a man is is to ask the one who came up with the idea of man, who formed man, who created man, God himself. Imagine Thomas Edison walking out of the room after creating the light bulb and holding his hand and someone grabbing it and saying, this looks like a great high stakes hacky sack and starts trying to kick it up in the air. And Edison says, that thing was made for far more than that. It was actually made to produce light. That's what's happening in culture very often is that the culture is grabbing the idea of manhood and saying, hey, this really should be this. And God is saying, it, it, it actually it was made for much more than that. It was made to produce light. We know biblically and, and, and even sociologically, we know that when men fill the role that men are supposed to fill, that the things around them, the wives, the children, the families, the jobs, the cultures, the communities, when men are filling the role that men are supposed to fill, the, the people and things around them tend to flourish. And when men fill that role, everything around them tends to struggle tends to not flourish. What I want to do in this short video is just give you a basic biblical definition of what it means to be a man using two main ideas. Matt Chandler did a sermon called the Imago Dei years ago, which was uh, paradigm shifting for me, and he talks about some of these things. But the passage is Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, which says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now, the two words I want to focus on there are working and keeping. That the Lord God took the man, that is, put, took Adam, and put him in the garden to work the garden and to keep the garden. Now, a couple of things that are important. This is before Eve is created, and it's before the fall. Right, The fall happens in chapter 3. So we're here in the Garden of Eden in paradise, where there is no sin, where everything is good and very good, and it's here that God gives Adam the charge to work. That's interesting because very often we think of work as a necessarily negative thing. We think of work as the product of sin only. But this is before sin exists that God assigns Adam the task of working, assigns him a task in general. And in fact, heaven's going to be the same way. Heaven is not going to be couch sitting. We're going to have responsibilities and things to do because you were made for that. All of us. We're made to work. And, and it seems to be especially that men were made to work hard. And God expects that of us. That's what we were made for. And in fact, we are harming ourselves if we fail to work. You may know people. I, I know people. Some of the most miserable people I know are those people who have, <clears throat> for whatever reason, are, are unable to work. Whether it be health reasons or whether they found a loophole in the government that sends them a check every month. Those people are the most miserable people because you indeed were made to work. And you were made to work hard, especially you men. We're made to work hard. We're made to sweat, whether physically or figuratively. We're made to struggle. We're made to strive. We're made for these things. And to fail to do so is not just to fail 
to be productive. It's, it's to fail your own soul, your own very being, that God made you to be that way. God made you to be a, a hard worker. Uh, so to not do so is to hurt yourself. You know, at the end of the day, there's this sort of, there's a sort of satisfaction and fulfillment that comes with work that doesn't really make sense, right? That after, after a good day's work or like an athlete, after a hard practice, after a hard workout, after a hard training, after, after hard labor, that you feel good. There's a, there's a, there's a fulfillment. There's also, it almost physically feels good to have accomplished a hard job, to have, to have worked hard during a day. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, under an evolutionary worldview, for instance, the lion doesn't do that, right? The lion doesn't find find value in working alone. It, the whole goal of the evolutionary mindset is just survival, so to spend less calories than you eat. Um, so the lion sleeps and the lion hunts. That's about it, right? Not a lot of work, just done for the work's sake. But with, with humanity, it's it's oddly different that we find a sort of fulfillment in the work itself. We find a joy in the work itself. We find a satisfaction in the work itself, and that's an odd thing. If we weren't made to work, as it seems from Genesis chapter two that we that we were. I as a husband, as a father, should be the hardest worker in my home. I should be the the biggest sacrificer in the sake of work in my home. I was talking to a couple of my brothers in Christ last night. One just had a new baby. Uh, the others of us have had a couple of babies, a few babies. And we were talking about how much better husbands we were with the second baby than with the first baby and how we did a lot better of getting up and doing more of the baby things than we did the first time. It's by the process of sanctification, I guess. But what it means to be a man is to be a, is to be a hard worker, that, that there should be more required of you than of others, uh, than of women and children. Now, secondly, the idea of keeping, which is the idea of protection, idea of watching over, idea of guarding. So Adam was charged with the task of working and working hard. So, so one of the things a man is supposed to be is a hard worker. So to you men out there, to be a man means to work hard. To you women out there, you need to search for a man that works hard. If you, if you, a man that doesn't work hard is not worthy of you. And it's going to cause a lot of problems. You want a hard worker. You must be a hard worker. And then secondly, a man that will guard, that will watch over, that will protect, that will keep. Now, a lot of this is just physical, right? Men are physically stronger than women. Our shoulders are broader. Our muscles are more dense. We have astronomical amount more of testosterone than women do. Men are just stronger than women physically. It's not always the case, of course. The strongest women in the world are stronger than uh, the weaker men or average men. But the strongest women in the world are never going to compare to the strongest men in the world. We are just made stronger by God. So because of that, we are expected to be the ones primarily that go to war. We're to be the ones primarily that uh, handle danger. Like, for instance, I've been married for, I don't know, 5,000 days, something like that, 10 years, however long that is, 4,500 days, and uh, 4,000 days, whatever the number is. Um, and probably 2,000 of those days, that's <laughs> an exaggeration, probably 1,000 of those days, I have gotten up in the middle of the night to my wife's shoving about some noise in the middle of the night that was surely this time actually a burglar, right? <laughs> Imagine what you would think of me if tonight, when there's a bump in the night, I leaned over to my wife, Ariel, and I said, babe, babe, somebody's out there. And she says, nobody's out there. Go back to sleep. And I said, no, this time somebody is, right? This time... <laughs> This time somebody's really there. This time I'm sure of it. Somebody is there. Will you please go check on the kids? Please. And Ariel says, oh, okay. Nobody's going to be there, but I'll go. And she gets up and goes to take on the potential burglar. Right? You would think nothing of me. You would, the Ohachi people would kick me out of the job here, as they should. What kind of man would, would I be uh, to let my wife be the one that goes out? But the interesting thing is, of course, that that is just expected. Right? Christian or non-Christian alike agree that if there's a bump in the night, the one that should get up and go fight, should go face death, should go face the potentiality of harm, is the man. If anyone's going to sacrifice, it should be the man. If anyone's going to go down, it should be the man. If anyone's going to suffer, if anyone's going to experience pain, it should be the man. Right? That we know that. That when there's a bump in the night, I get up. I go to fight the burglar that we've not had yet in 10 years, but my wife has been convinced of at least 600 times. <laughs> 
But it's the man's job, right? We know that. Something inside of us says that's what the man is supposed to do. The man is supposed to watch over. The man is supposed to keep. The man is supposed to protect. A few years ago in Colorado, uh, 2012, in Aurora, Colorado, there was a shooting at a, at a Batman movie um, where a man co- came in and pulled out a gun and opened fire and killed many people. There were three young men on a, a triple date, I believe, at the time with three girls. And um, when the man came in with the gun, those three men put those girls down on the ground and laid their bodies on top of those women to guard them, to watch over them, to protect them. And those three women that night were saved because the, before the bullets hit their bodies, they went through the bodies of the men. And all three of those men died. And all three of those women lived. And they were praised worldwide. This is what manhood is, they said. Christian, non-Christian alike. This is what men are supposed to be. This is what men are supposed to do. This is what we cannot lose in our culture is men that are willing to sacrifice for the sake of others. That same year, a uh, cruise ship crashed um, off of one of the coasts. I forget which one it is. And you can find these pretty easy Google searches. A cruise ship crashed, and the men on that ship pushed past the women and the children to get on the lifeboats. So the men were the ones that were saved. The women and children went down with the boats. And these men were ridiculed, crucified around the world. What happened to women and children first? What happened to manhood? What happened to real men? What kind of supposed man would do this? Right? And we agree with all those things, of course as Christians who have reasons for those things. But even non-Christians say these things, right? Because there's something down inside of us, at the bottom of us, as humans, that say the men should sacrifice. The men should guard. The men should protect. The men should watch over. R.C. Sproul Jr. talks about, he has two young sons, or he did at the time he wrote this. And he said the one thing he tried to instill in his sons was that boys protect girls. That men protect women. And he tells a story about how one of his young sons was riding down a driveway, which was down a hill at his driveway, on his big wheel. And said he was hauling, like he did a lot. But he said he noticed this time that there was the next door neighbor's daughter. Son was about five, daughter was six or seven, I think he said. Daughter was riding towards the, their driveway and that the collision was imminent. And so he throws the door open and starts running down the hill as if he's going to catch them. And he looks and sees his five-year-old son as he's riding down this hill. And his son looks up and sees the little girl. And he rolls the big wheel over and he tumbles down the sidewalk, down the concrete, across the road, down the hill, and is knocked unconscious. And so Sproul runs down there and grabs his son, takes him to the hospital. And when the son wakes up, one of the first things he says to his dad is, boy goes down and girl goes free. Right, dad? Boy goes down and girl goes free, which is a statement that he gave to them. The boy goes down and the girl goes free. There's something in us that tells us that that is right. You may have seen the uh, story lately, a couple years ago, uh, maybe been last year, about the young boy with his little sister. And I think it was a pit bull, but some dog came running after them while they were outside, and the little boy got in the way of the sister and took on the dog, this young boy, to protect his sister. And the boy was just mangled by this dog, lived. But this this young, young boy praised rightfully so as a man that is doing what men are supposed to do. Men are supposed to protect. Men are supposed to watch over. Men are supposed to guard. And the reason that is, is because that's been placed at the very bottom of us since the beginning, that God put at our bottoms, that that is who we are supposed to be. We have the role of working. We have the role of keeping, of watching over. The boy goes down and the girl goes free. Ephesians chapter 5 is a passage about marriage, but one of the sections in there is relevant to, to this discussion where it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In the modern feminist world, they will get upset about Ephesians chapter 5, saying, well, the husband gets to be Christ and the wife is the church. But they're, they're missing the point. But the point here is that the husband has to be Christ. Have you seen the story of Jesus? Have you heard the story of Christ? Do you see what happens to him? He's beaten for the sake of the church. He is bloodied. He is mocked. He is spit upon for the sake of the church. He is crucified for the sake of the church. He is killed, murdered for the sake of the church. 
And the message from Paul is, here is that the husbands are supposed to do the same thing for their wives, that they're supposed to do whatever it takes to watch over, to love, to protect, to even sanctify. Uh, Christ is the one sanctifying, but to present them as spiritually mature, to do whatever it takes to guard their wives against spiritual attacks, against physical attacks, and their children their homes by extension as well. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The task of the man, quite simply, is to give himself up. That is your task, is to sacrifice for the sake of those around you. You might say, if you're a young man especially, you might say, hold on, I have to do all the sacrificing? Right? That's not fair. I have to go down, I have to protect her, I have to be Christ in this picture, and she gets to be the church, she gets to be me. I have to take responsibility for my family's spiritual life. I have to be the head of the household in that way when I grow up. I have to be the one who dies so she can live. It's not fair. You're right. It's not fair. How many, how many men that you really respect look up to? How many of those men stomp around saying, it's not fair? That's not fair. That's not fair. How many... How many men that you respect stomp around complaining about life being not fair? And then I want you to think about how many two-year-olds you see doing that. How many children you see stomping around saying it's not fair? Because that's what children do. That's what children do. My boys aren't allowed to say it's not fair. Of course it's not fair. It's not going to be fair. If you want to be a man, the kind of God called you to be, it's not going to be fair. Men don't want fair. Little boys want fair. Men don't want fair. Men want the fight. Men weren't made to make sure everything is done fairly to them. Men were made to go to war for their wives, for their children, for their jobs, for their communities. Men were made to fight. That's what men want. We've been designed to fight for the glory of God and for the people he's put in our lives. It's not fair. (laughs) So what? Fairness is overrated. That kind of fairness is overrated. Men want to fight. So, men, work hard. And work in such a way that people say, that man's working for something besides himself. To the glory of the Lord. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of the Lord. If you're doing that, you're going to be a hard worker. Women, do not accept someone. Do not date. Don't go out with a man who's not a hard worker. And men, now, if you're, if you're not married, if you don't have children, and you're, then whatever people are around you, whether it be other men, weaker men, whether it be women, whether it be children, all those that are around you, it is your job to watch over, to look after, to stand between them and the devil when you can, to stand between them and evil when you can. And if you're a husband, or if you're going to be a husband and a father, then it is your task to watch over your home spiritually, chiefly spiritually, and physically as well, and all other things, to watch over, to guard and protect. It is that that has been put at your very bottom, working and keeping, watching over those that God has put around you. And ladies, that is the only kind of man worth even going out with once, much less continuing to date. Love you. Talk to you soon.